morning and welcome to the 21st meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for 2018. May I ask everyone present to turn electrical devices to silent and uh, we'd note that we have received apologies from committee members Gordon MacDonald and Gillian Martin. Uh, I'll start by asking Willie Coffey to declare any relevant interests. Yeah, thank you, convener. No relevant interests other than what's already on my register. Thank you. Thank you. Now, item one is a decision by the committee to take items five, six, and seven in private. Are we agreed on that? Yes. Thank you. We, we turn now to our inquiry into the impact of bank closures. And for our first panel, we have two witnesses. First of all, uh, Professor Russell Griggs, OBE, welcome. And also Thomas Doherty, who's the public affairs manager of which. So welcome to both of you. And um, I, I would like to start with what's a fairly general question before we move into some detail. And just what has been the, the impact of bank closures in your view on individuals, the local economy, local customers? What are the impacts, both positive and negative? Um, who would like to start? Uh, Professor Griggs. Yeah, it's interesting. When I did my work, which is now two years ago, and went back and spoke to communities that um, had lost their banks, if I can put it that way, um, it's in, there is no long-term empirical evidence just now to show that there's any effect. And if you go back and speak to a lot of the communities, like most communities do, they've moved on. Um, so they find other ways to do things, etc. So while there was a heavy impact at the time, the communities, the businesses, etc., have found other ways of doing what they were going to do. So, um, and in fact, one of them, when I went to see them, said, you know, it's, it's pointless having the discussion because we've all moved on now and we don't want to go back to where we were. So I think it probably has a short-term effect, but the evidence that I saw as I went round and visited probably 20 or 30 places across the whole of the UK looking on this is it settles down again and people go back to doing what they used to do, but just in a different way. And it's interesting, they don't tend to move banks. Um, so I remember being not in Scotland but down in England and I sat for an hour and a half and got lambasted by a group of customers about their bank and I asked them at the end of it how many had changed and they all said, oh, we're not changing. It's a really good bank. We, we like the bank. It's just this wasn't a particular thing we, we wanted them to do and they had just found different ways of doing it. And have you set out the detailed findings regarding this somewhere? Yep, you can read my um, one year on review, the Access to Banking Protocol. You can find it on the UK Finance website. So your uh, view is that there are immediate impacts, but no long-term impacts? Not from the evidence I have seen to date. Uh, Thomas Doherty, do you uh, share that view? I mean, first thing we would say is that we don't object to the principle of bank branch closures. It's a, it, it has to be a commercial decision and you know just an example we were talking about earlier on was if you remember th four or five years ago um, after the nationwide had taken over the Dunfermline Building Society and two other building societies based in England at the end of the five-year moratorium there was a closure process um, because for example on Dunfermline High Street it, it, it was indefensible from a commercial point of view that you had a nationwide brand and an unfermented brand 270 yards apart and nobody, not the MP, not the MSPs, nobody would, would say that was sustainable. Um, the problem is that there is simply, as, as Professor Griggs says, there hasn't been a proper study done by anybody of what those longer term impacts would be of the rate of closures. So by the end of this year in Scotland, more than 250 branches will have closed in the last three years. So the last four years, starting in 2015. So I think from memory, it was 43 cl branches closed in 2015, 20, uh, 44 closed in 2016. It's 83 last year and 84 are scheduled to close by the end of this year. Now, I think when you start to get that scale of closures, somebody should be stepping up and carrying out that, that uh, proper investigation. That, that, that Professor Griggs has talked about. The people who are most likely, of course, to be affected are older um, uh, customers um, and customers who are more vulnerable. Um, you, you know, yes, online banking is growing, but only 56% of customers, according to UK Finance, currently use online banking. So what is happening to the other 44%? How are their needs being serviced? No. 
I, and I suppose if I could add, uh, as some of you know, I've just finished doing 26 consultation meetings for another part of my life around the south of Scotland. And um, I had 650 people. Uh, the issue of bank branch closures didn't come up at all across all the 26 meetings other than in one place, I think it was Melrose, um, one of them, one of the, the, the people in the audience asked if the building was going to be free to be used for something else once it would be closed. So the communities that we went round didn't raise any issues at all. But what were those meetings about? This is a, about the new Economic Development Agency for the South of Scotland and what business can do and what the issues were that business were having at the time across the whole of the South of Scotland. So I mean, it was it was wide open for anybody to say anything. Yes, Thomas Stafford. I, I, I don't dispute what Professor Griggs is saying. All I would observe is by the and I, uh, all of you will know this: the nature of people who attend meetings are not, by their nature, the vulnerable customers. And I think that's that's the problem with anecdotal based decision making. There needs to be that robust evidence gathered. And, and would you say there's an impression amongst people that it makes no difference what they say, whether the banks close their branches or not, and therefore, why would they raise the subject? Probably. Yeah. Thank you. I'll turn to Dean Lockhart now. Um, thank you, convener, and good morning to our guests. I'd like to move on to a question about the alternatives available to, to banks and how suitable and how viable they are. We've heard from different witnesses about the services available from the post office, mobile banking units, credit unions, building societies. I'd like to get your views on uh, how those alternatives might plug the gap where uh, bank branch closures have happened in, in a local community. And in your answer, if you could talk perhaps about the different demographics affected, uh, so retail, the elderly, and possibly small business. Um, if I could start with the post office. Sure. Um, I think the challenge with the post office is the post office in itself is so diverse. So you've got everything from normal post offices to little branches in Nisa and places like that, and that is the challenge. And I know, so it's not at the moment as good as it could be and it should be, but I know the banks are working to try and make it easier. So, for example, at the moment, if you're a post office employee or indeed an Anisa employee who's got to listen to the post office, there are eight different ways that, um, depending on the bank you have, that you've got to, you can pay and take out money, which to me has always seemed a bit overcomplicated. So I think there is, in terms of the post office, uh, the banks could do a lot more to make it simpler. Um, I think in terms of business, if it's done properly, it can resolve a lot of the issues that business are talking about in terms of cash in and cash out. But again, it's got to be made simpler. Um, Part of the challenge is about the amount of money that each of the post offices will take. So they're not all legally bound to take the same amount of money. It depends on the, um, the situation and whether they have um, the, the appropriate um, instruments to do that. In terms of the other mobiles, I have a mobile in my own community. I live in Sanker down in Dufries and Galloway. So we have one branch that's open four days a week now and they're all bank come in a mobile van every week. And um, it's it's seems to work quite well for those that want to use it. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the others, uh, there are a lot of people looking at and not just credit unions, but whether community banking would be a way forward. Um, and I do, outside of London at the moment, I haven't seen any examples of where that's happened, although I know there are one or two franchises beginning to look at it down in the southwest of England. But to me, the, ish, the, the biggest issue is, I know the banks are working on it, is a to make people aware that they can use a post office and how they can use it, and then making it simpler for people to use a post office. Yeah, I mean, I mean first in terms of building societies, from a customer point of view, that there are some corporate differences, but the reality is from a customer point of view, there is no difference between a bank and a, and a building society in terms of the retail, retail offer. Um, in terms of post offices, um, that there is a kind of catch-22 that we, that we find ourselves in um, that, um, to be able to pay money into a post office, you need a personalised paying-in slip um, from your bank. So where do you get those slips from? You get them from your local branch. So that needs to be addressed if we're going to take that forward. Um, the other uh, proposal that we have suggested is that more could be done through ATMs. Um, now, Link aren't enthusiastic um, about this, but uh, Link could be uh, mandated um, to provide greater services 
for, for example, paying in um, of, of, of cash into, into, their, into their machines. Um, so I think it isn't about there being one alternative, it's about that combination of three, four different options for um, taking it forward. If I could just sorry, just follow up on that, and th thank you for those answers. Uh, there has been some concern expressed by the Federation of Small Business about the gap um, available for, for small retailers in terms of cash in, cash out, but also the other wider range of services that businesses can access if you have a branch, lending, uh, business advice. Um, do you agree that there is a, a gap uh, if a bank branch closes, there, there would be a gap uh, even if you have a post office nearby, there would be a gap for small and other businesses uh, that use that branch? I mean, it's interesting. As far as I'm aware, maybe only one bank now, even when they're open, will do lending to small businesses from a branch. Um, so I'm not sure in terms of lending it would make a great difference because you would have to go and book a meeting with somebody who would have to come from somebody somewhere else anyway to, to have it um, because my knowledge of the banks is, is quite extensive in this area is that they d I think one probably does lend from a branch, but that's all. So it won't impact, it shouldn't impact on the way that a small business can borrow, because most of it will be done on the telephone or by making an appointment with a specialist to come and see them. I, mean, I think you hit on a, an important point that it is about the round. It's a, and, a, and, f and I think for too long, we've dealt with bank branch closures over here and ATM closures over here. And it's that combination of the two. And, you know, and, and we have no view on the political structure, but we have two different regulators, for example. The FCA is responsible for banks, the PSR is responsible for ATMs. Um, and we're working with the FSB very closely to say, well, if you do both, if you take away both the banks and you take away the ATMs, how do small businesses pay cash in? I mean, there are 15 billion cash transactions in 2016 that's the that's the latest year for which we have figures but cash transactions are still the single most popular form of payment 44 percent of consumers uh, sorry 44 percent of consumer transactions were cash so if you're seeing 250 uh, bank uh, branches being closed in scotland and by link's own figures up to 700 atms going from the scottish network at the same time then that, that becomes much harder for, for, for consumers and for businesses. Yeah, I mean, but I disagree with Thomas. I think he's right about the cash, but it is going down. I mean, cash is being used less um, over time if you look at the, the drift down, um, but it is still quite important. I think also one of the things as well, and I, I, I talk in my own little community to the retailers there, it's about them getting help to look at what the alternatives are as well. So um, when our RBS shut, um, or some time ago, and some of them still have to travel to do that, which they don't really need to do if they were told better how to do it in another way. So they could go into the local post office. As you know, my, uh, we, we have a post office in Sanker, so they could go in there. Um, they could theoretically go and do it at another bank, but um, it's much better to do it at the post office if they can. And they can do it. It's just about being, uh, exactly as Thomas said, they have to, they have to certify themselves to do it. And Thank Colin you. Beattie. Thank you, I'd like to just expand a little bit on the question of the ATMs. We've taken evidence from businesses which uh, indicates that uh, something like 85% of their transactions are actually still in cash. And uh, they seem to be indicating that, that that level is pretty stable. We've talked about the, the need to be able to take money in and take money out and the impact that that has on those businesses. How integral now are ATMs to the individuals and to the businesses in that process? I think ATMs are, are quite critical now to businesses. Now, I think the quicker we move to the more sophisticated um, types of ATMs that can do um, inputs as well as outputs, the, the better. That won't help cash in terms of coins, but it will obviously help cash in terms of notes. It's interesting, if you look in Scandinavia now, and I can't remember whether it's Norway or Sweden, the government bought the ATM infrastructure and now operates it themselves on the grounds that they can then choose how to do it and they charge the banks a fee for using it so they can guarantee everybody um, free service and they can decide where it goes. Uh, and that was done with the cooperation of the banking community 
Um, and it appears to work quite well from what I can gather is that they operate it on a sort of cost neutral basis. So the fees coming in from the banks allow them to do the infrastructure. So I think it is very important. And it's interesting, my understanding is now that RBS, having all the fuss about the branch closures, have guaranteed now that they won't take an ATM away from anywhere. So they're keeping it in Barra, for example, if it's further away than a kilometre from the next ATM. So I think that type of discussion is helpful, but they are important. When you RBS uh, s several years ago said that they would, they would never close the last bank in town. That didn't last too long. So anyway, moving on. Um, a number of businesses have indicated, and I'm not sure what proportion this actually is, they say that they actually top up the cash machines themselves. So, there's a, so, so they use their own resources to top the cash machine, which must help with uh, the cash position. Not I'm aware of. No? No, and in fact, one of the reasons I'm, I'm shaking my head is that <clears throat> I know if you've got an ATM and <coughs> excuse me, if you've got an ATM in a banking building and you want to use the banking building, Loomis and G4S and all the people that deliver the money will make it quite difficult for you to operate around that ATM. Um, so, no, I, that's news to me, I have to say. This seemed to be in, in some of the small grocer shops where there's a, a local ATM. It, it, it's, it's possibly a question for Link, who I know you've got later, um, but I, I can't imagine how that would work, but I'm not the expert. I'd be interested in finding out a bit more about that. But given the fact that you've talked about ATMs closing and so on, how do we protect vulnerable customers in, in this whole picture? I mean, we're talking about remote ATMs closing down, presumably because it's not the volume of use or whatever, but the customers using it, nevertheless, are probably the most vulnerable in our society. And it seems to me that the ATMs are actually withdrawing into an urban environment more than a, a rural environment. And, you know, we seem to be getting this uh, gap in the population. Yeah. As I say, you know, Kavina, we've, we've been very clear that we don't... We, we would like to see an end to an approach where there is frankly a silo between the FCA and the PSR, and it needs to be seen as a round. It's the bank branches and the ATMs need to be taken as, as, as a pair. Um, so I think there are probably three things. We, we would want to see, uh, the, want to see a, a really robust piece of work done that actually says what is that long-term impact of the, of the, of the closure, um, particularly on vulnerable customers. And, and the other thing I would say is that, you know, we're very clear it's not just rural um, ATMs and branches that are at risk. Um, it's also in financially challenged um, um, urban areas where quite often those branches have come out and that obviously cash is particularly important. But I thought um, there was a system there where there was more compensation given to keeping ATMs open in those areas. Th th there is a very, there's a very specific criteria for very rural areas but that's not I mean, look, part, part of the problem as you will hear from link when they give evidence is link have been unable um, to tell us which of the uh, cash machines in which which of the ATMs in Scotland or indeed across the UK are at risk and you know I mean look my local Asda has three cash points side by side all operated by the same bank no one would object to one of those three coming out, but that's probably not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is rural cash points and those in the more deprived areas. So we're very clear that it's not, it's not a rural versus urban. It's financially challenged um, areas are the ones more likely to come out. So the, so the first thing is there needs to be a robust piece of work. Secondly, um, the PSR needs to now be challenging Link about the impact of its decisions, and the PSR has refused so far, has been unwilling to, to challenge Link on its decision to cut uh, the payments um, from that it, it receives. Um, and thirdly, the FCA needs to do more because, you, you know, there isn't much point. You know, we have the, we have the 2015 Access to Banking <coughs> Protocol, which says that there should be consultation with, with, with communities before banks shut. That hasn't really led to any change of decisions. Um, and, I, and I think that I don't need to tell um, people around this table that, that people have that, 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 that communities lose confidence in consultations if they think it's simply a process that is going through and no changes will come at the end of that. So those 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 are the three things that that we think need to take place now. And if we go back to your question on um, 
on, on the rural areas. I mean, that was specifically the reason, if I, under, if I recall correctly, is why whichever Scandinavian country it was bought their infrastructure. Is so that the government could control where it was, um, and as I said, it was done in the co with cooperation of the banks. So uh, they, they removed the challenge of, because the challenge is Thomas knows is the infrastructure isn't owned by one in, one person; it's owned by a multitude of people, yeah. um, all who can make different decisions. And if you look at the 2006 task force, which was chaired by John McFall, who at the time was chair of the the Treasury you know, select committee, you know, it, it, it specifically highlighted the need for low income areas to access free to use cash points. I would argue, which would argue that is more important even in 2018 than it was in 2006. And that's at risk now. You know, one in, as I say, Link's own figures, there's, there's, there's a huge variation on how many cash points are at risk. Um, KPMG, who are Link's advisors, said it could be up to 18%. Link's own figures, let's use that, is 11%, up to 11% of cash points could be going as a result of this. That is 700 cash points in Scotland. That is 9 to 10 per constituency in Scotland. I suspect if, if, if you had to go around your constituencies and start picking the 9 or 10 that you thought should go or would go, it'd be interesting to see which ones would be at risk. I think a figure was given of 44% of bank customers don't use online banking? Correct, sir, yeah. So we can surmise that a proportion of these at least will be in the more vulnerable bra bracket. Absolutely. What would the with how does the withdrawal of the ATM then affect them? If, they can't, if, they, if they're not doing online banking, presumably some of them at least will be able to cope with an ATM, although, frankly, as you get older, it becomes more difficult to deal with even the basic technology. Go on. I was going to say, I think if you look at how the banks look at how branches will go in the future, the ones that will remain, is interesting enough they will go back to becoming much more advice centres than anything else. Um, and I think one of the things they've looked at is as you go through this process of what, of how people are now interacting with uh, um, um, finance and using it, um, the, the, it tells you that in the end what people want most of is advice of somewhere to go for help not necessarily to do a transaction because you can do the transaction on the ATM and a lot of the sophisticated ones. So I think the nature of branches will change anyway. And if you look at um, some of the models that they've put across the UK of what those new branches look like, they're very interesting, and go back to be places where you go for advice rather than to do transactions. And I guess that's where uh, the, the type of people that Thomas was talking about have the, the, the biggest challenge, which is, a, is an advice rather than transactions. Yeah, I mean, with, with the, uh, we, we don't have Scottish-specific figures because they're, they're obviously come from UK um, sources, but there are 2.7 million um, uh, consumers at UK level who rely overwhelmingly on cash. So we can obviously do a rough calculation of what that would be in Scotland, and I suspect actually it's probably a, a disproportionate number. Those, those are the people who are going to be most affected by any, uh, any reduction in this combination of bank branches and ATMs. There are, there, are, there are three reasons why people predominantly prefer uh, banking in person to online banking. Um, convenience, which frankly, I think many of the banks are doing their best to try and take away, um, but it's connectivity um, and it's confidence. So, you know, connectivity, if you're frankly, if, you're, if you don't have broadband or you don't have access to your own computer, then you can't do um, uh, online banking, you know, I mean, uh, 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 Professor Griggs talked about apps and so on. Well, that's great if you've got a smartphone, but many of your constituents, the people who are most financially excluded, don't have smartphones. Um, so they can't do online banking, they can't use apps. Um, and, then, and then the third is confidence. And frankly, debacles like the TSB over the last couple of weeks will have done nothing to let the TSB get more of its customers to switch to online banking. So... You know, it is a it is a combination. You know, 40, 44 percent of people aren't using online banking, as you said, Mr. Beatty. Some of that is because of convenience. Some of that is because of connectivity, and some of that is because they just don't have confidence in the system. And I would say gently, I don't think it's just an older people's issue. Yeah, and, um, we sh and we shouldn't get hung up in cash. It comes back to the point I was making earlier, and Thomas was making. There is no real evidence. There's a really interesting article um, by a company called Voltex on cash use in the UK, and it comes to three conclusions. Three conclusions are cash usage is declining, cash usage is growing, and cash usage is staying about the same. 
Um, <laughs> and it's looked at three sets of the data that's out there, and it's come to those three conclusions. And that's part of the challenge, is that all the data out there conflicts with each other. And until we go away and have a long look at what all the data says, then, because I mean, if you look at the declining, it says 64% of all payments were made in cash. In 20, 2005, the figure has dropped to 45% in 2015. On the other hand, though, the value of the banknotes in circulation has gone up. Um, and then the other one is the value of all payments made by cash decreased by only 3%. So all the data seems to conflict, conflict with each other, and it's back to Tom. There is really no good empirical data on any of this. Could we move on to Fulton McGregor now? Well, the main part of my question has kind of been covered uh, in, in your last answer, but it's, it's to do with this um, 8 to 18 per cent reduction uh, that, that which uh, put into their submission for uh, current and remote free ATMs. What impact is that likely to have specifically on communities where there is no bank? Perhaps there was a last bank in town scenario and that that's now closed. So specifically to to those communities? So that is a, it's a really good um, question. I mean, we already have, there are, there are, there are something like 200 um, cash deserts um, in the UK. You know, that's, that's somewhere where there is no access either to a branch or, or ATM within a reasonable distance. And, and, and again, the problem is always going to be how do you find a reasonable distance? Um, so, because, you know, if you've got very good public transport from one community to another. And we were talking about this beforehand. Um, 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 Professor Griggs lives in Sanka. Um, frankly, anyone who knows that part of Dumfries and Galloway knows that really it's three communities in one. It's Sanka, Kirkconnell, and Kellerholm. So uh, we, are, we are slightly cautious about you know, how we define a community. But there are, there are 200 communities in the UK that are cash, um, cash deserts. 130 of those are in Scotland, which is you know, that's two thirds of those by my maths. Are in, are in Scotland. It is overwhelmingly in very rural um, areas. Um, it, it's difficult, and, it's, and, and this is where it all ties together, it is very difficult for those small businesses who are trying to operate um, because they need to pay, their, the, the, they need to, to, to pay in cash um, and because they can't keep holding long, uh, you know. But also, it's very difficult for, uh, for their customers um, because uh, if they can't get access to cash, with the best of all in the world, if you are on a fixed income and you're expected to travel 30, 40 minutes to get your pension out, um, that's that's clearly not 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 acceptable. So, you know that that is the type of problem that we're that we're seeing, and that that problem will grow as bank branches uh, continue and as ATM closures um, happen. And as Thomas said, I mean, when I <coughs> excuse me, when I did my work looking at which branches are closed. And you go to these communities like my own, which are really two communities. So if you go to Glastonbury and the one next door to it, and if you go to Invergordon and the one next door to it, you, you'll find that the branch is open in the, in the community that has Lidl in it, or you know, a, a shopping centre where people go to do their... So if uh, not in the other one. So it, it kind of follows the, the pattern of where people go to do all the other things they do on a day-to-day -day basis. And similarly in Glastonbury, it's gone to the town next to Glastonbury because they have the big shopping centre there and not in Glastonbury itself. So the bank, so people go to do their shopping, go and do their banking rather than, so it, the, the community, what defines a community has changed. Thomas is quite correct in a lot of this as well. So, so how do you think that these um, cash deserts, as you, as, as you put it, um, impact on people with disabilities? Hugely. I, I mean, I was interested to see the Equality Human Rights Commission um, taking an interest now uh, in in the issue of the bank branch closures. I think that's a sensible decision by the by the by the commission because that has to be explored. And as I say, you know, we we supported the 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 2015 protocols. We are unconvinced that they've actually led to a significant change in behaviour, uh, Mr. McGregor. You know that. Um, there has to, you know, what, you know, look, it is a balancing act. Financial institutions are commercial organisations. We we, under, we understand that, um, but they do have a duty to the communities that they that they serve, and we're not convinced that that, that is necessary. That balance hasn't necessarily been struck yet, and I think it's worth asking the FCA uh, whether or not they feel that that. 
that, that they've done enough to, to, to actually address those concerns. And, and how do you think these, these cash deserts, again, can affect sort of local small businesses? And I use the example of Steps in, in my constituency, which is facing a, a last bank in town closure that I'm sure my colleagues are uh, sick of hearing about Steps. Um, but, it, you know, I, I use the example there because there's a lot of lo local small businesses, cafes, um, stuff like that, where they don't have any swipe. So if that buy, if they also lose the cash machine there, there's there's obviously going to be a struggle. No, I mean, we did a survey in May 2018 of uh, consumers, specifically in Scotland, and one in seven people said that the loss of, and I stress it's the combination, I don't want to single out just ATMs, but a combination, that loss of free, free access to cash would leave one in seven uh, uh, consumers across Scotland as a whole um, unable or, or finding it much harder to be able to pay for services, to pay for shopping and so on. It is common sense that that would disproportionately be um, across those more um, rural or uh, 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 less connected areas. But I pivot right back to my first answer, convener. There isn't the there isn't the proper evidence. We can we can make those assumptions based on the surveys we've done and, and on common sense. But we agree with Professor Griggs. Somebody needs to step up and actually do that empirical research. Uh, and indeed, it goes back to the point that Mr. Lockhart was making: is we shouldn't have remembered in all this. <clears throat> the role of the post office, because they're worried about ATMs going away. But if post offices started to shut down or got smaller and therefore couldn't take in the amount of money that perhaps small businesses want to, then that would have an impact as well. So I think that's one of the things we, we shouldn't forget about in all this, mm -hmm. is as, you know, as post offices shrink and they go back to being part of the co-op or NISA or whatever it is in an area, their ability to take in money across the county will become less. When I was up in Invergordon, somebody was telling me what, uh, that he'd gone in as a business to pay in £10,000 in cash into his local post office. It took them 25 minutes to count the £10,000 because they, they, they have to do it by the rule book, whereas if you go into the bank, they, can, they, they take it and they can put it through the machine at the back and yeah. test it. So there are issues, but I think we, the point that Mr Lockhart is a really good one is that in all the talk about ATMs, we shouldn't forget about the post offices and make sure that they're there to provide the service. And that's why I think the conversations that the bank are having with them at the moment, battle the banks are having with them at the moment, about making that, that service better is absolutely critical in this. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, Link will, I'm sure, tell you their brilliant um, financial um, inclusion programme, but it only covers less than 3% of the ATMs. Um, you, you know, so we're not knocking that bit, we think that's that's good, but it's it's frankly not enough. Right. Um, Jamie Halker Johnson. Good morning to the panel. Um, I was just w wanted to ask on the 2006 um, task force what lessons um, we have learnt, what lessons we should have learnt um, from that uh, in relation to the bank closures that we're seeing at the moment. The 2006? 2006 task force, the... Um, before my time, as they say. Right. Um, so I didn't become involved in this probably till 2011, 2012. But I, I, but I think, I, and it goes back to the point, I, th I, th I think, and I, the word consultation is used in a lot on this, and this was never meant to be a consultation. What this is, the words go something like, the bank makes a decision and then it works with the people in the community to see if there's anything it can do to lessen the closure. So there was never going to be a consultation about the closure, that's a decision that the bank was made, and that, that's why the protocol was put in place back in 2013, 2014, to try and give them some framework in which to do that. But all the parties, including the FSB and the governments, etc., accepted that this was a commercial decision for the bank to make on when it closed. Yes, they have to do it in a way that then deals with the vulnerable people and all the stuff, and I think they've moved a long way to try and do that. There's still work to do. Um, so. In terms of the 2006 passport, I'll pass because I'm not quite sure what that, what its recommendations were. A couple of things. I mean, they mentioned the financial inclusion pre um, premium. They also mentioned um, uh, uh, a greater role for the public sector in terms of planning and encouraging uh, more free-to-use ATMs and, and also transparency in charging. Yeah. So a little fact. Yeah. I, that's more your area than mine. I mean, yeah. I mean, to say this was the John McFall mm. um, chaired um, task force. And I think you know it's actually worth just trying to remember why that came about. That came about because John chaired the Treasury Select Committee at, at Westminster, and there was, a, there was a debate in the Commons where uh, John and the, the Economic Secretary at the time, I think it was Ivan Lewis, both said, look, actually, 
that, and this is where the kind of irony is, there are lots of people trying to do investigations. There are lots of people trying to do studies. Yeah. Let's bring actually everybody together. Um, so they involved, there were consumer organisations, the, the financial institutions took part, the Treasury, I think, um, the Treasury Select Committee and others all took part and they came up with these, it's about 20 pages and it's a really useful and it, and, it, and it still, as I say, it is still relevant today because some of those central um, recommendations around the need for low income areas to be guaranteed free to use access, you know, is, is actually even more relevant, I would argue, given the, given the current closure of, 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 of banks, that um, uh, ATMs in those remote areas, go back to Mr Beatty's point, you know, absolutely needed to be, to be guaranteed. And, and, and our argument is that there has to be more than just 3% of the total number of, of ATMs in the system, and that financial inclusion is at the heart of the debate about access to cash. So my short answer after all that, Mr. Hackery Johnson, is that it is even more relevant today than it was even in 2006 when it was um, um, written. It and is. I think where we need to move on to, though, in that is, and it goes back, this isn't just about going and looking at the evidence, which we need to do, but it's all to look at it much more holistically. This isn't just about ATMs. This isn't just about bank branches. This isn't just about post offices. It's about how we, as, our, as individuals, manage our finance and making sure that we all, all of us, and I do mean we all, have a way of doing that across the myriad of different ways that we can do that now. So it is about having a holistic approach to it. And, and it may be in the areas where ATMs can't be that there's another issue. I, I don't know, but I mean, unless you look at it holistically, it's very difficult to solve issues for all of us to do that. Well, that, I, that was one of the kind of points I was going to come to very much on a localised point of view for myself, the Highlands and Islands MSP. Um, obviously, large parts of the area, uh, the, the region, are remote and rural. Um, we have, uh, you know, large distances to, to even quite small um, towns and uh, areas. Um, a lot of the local businesses are very reliant on, on cash local stores and the like, uh, high areas of isolation, low wage economy in, in parts, and of course, as been mentioned, uh, um, real issues in terms of broad broadband. So um, if you give us a kind of idea of some of the particular issues that those remote r rural communities face, and also as in individuals, the impact on individuals within them, perhaps the more vulnerable and older people as well. Do you want to start? I mean, I actually, can I say, you know, particularly not just on um, rural areas, but on um, some other areas as well, one of the issues that we have been talking to FSB about is the impact on tourism mm. of not having cash available, particularly where you don't have good connectivity. Yeah. Um, and I think that, for what it's worth, we think that's, that, that's an area f within the Scottish economy that needs to be looked at. If, frankly, we've got tourists who can't get money out, then it becomes clearly more difficult for them to spend money and to support our Scottish economy. Um, so that, that should be something that probably particularly affects the... the rural Scotland. You're absolutely right, Mr. Michael Johnson, though. I mean, connectivity is, is so crucial, both in terms of digital connectivity and also in terms of, I guess, physical connectivity, being able to access. So, you know, again, if I use that example, at the other end of um, Scotland, in, in Dumfries and Galloway, if it, if it is quite easy to get from Sanka to Kirkconnell to access the cash, then there frankly isn't a great problem. For those of your constituents, who cannot make that journey for whatever reason easily, and, and that's where that, you know, that that's where that real problem um, um, comes about. So I think it is digital and it's physical connectivity. And as Professor Grigg says, it has to be taken as a as a round. This is probably more of a question for for uh, Link when we speak to them later. But um, the additional kind of costs and barriers for rural remote ATMs. I mean, I imagine things like security and obviously being able to, to refill, but are there other, other areas, that, issues that you know of? I, I think, I, I, I can only speak for us, we, we have struggled to get information. As I say, we have been very clear which, uh, which have been unable to get from, from, from Link information as to which of the 3,400 cash machines, um, sorry, these are the free-to-use cash machines mm -hmm. in Scotland um, are at risk. We have struggled to get an understanding from Link as to what the criteria is for which ones will be at risk, mm -hmm. and we struggled to get a full understanding as to what are the particular challenges. Um, I would, we would observe that if you've got, for argument's sake, 50 cash points mm -hmm. in a in a in a service row, one of which is protected and 49 isn't, and the 49 are going, common sense is that makes that one 
machine yeah. even more difficult, even more challenging to, to service. But as you say, you'll, 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 you'll hear from them shortly. I mean, in terms of the, um, the cash, I, I mean, the banks are very well aware of my view is that I can't see how a bunch of clever people that they have couldn't get together to um, figure out how you could go and pick it up in the first place. Um, it can't be with on the wit of man or woman to figure out how to... I mean, G4S is all over Scotland every day. So I think there are things they can do. Um, I'm, I'm, I've said that many times to them, that I think they could be cleverer at what they do in this. And it's not to do with IT um, in this particular case because it's cash. Um, I, and I, so I think there is a lot they could still do in that area, not just to do with ATMs, but just physical collection. Now it is difficult in some of the really rural areas in your part of the in your part of the world, but it's still possible. <coughs> and it's interesting if you speak to the um, the small businesses which I've done on this, um, a number of them are quite happy to, to select a sort of standard day away a, a week they would have their cash collected on, and then if they wanted it collected on another day to pay for that. So it's not an issue of cost. It's, it's an issue of just putting it together. Now, I know, again, the banks are talking about this, but I think it goes back to the point that Thomas was making. Unless we look at this in the round with everything else that's going on, we're going to end up solving at one problem but leaving another one left over there. The approach to it. Can I just go off very quickly as well? I think you mentioned the figure of 11%. Was it the link figure of 11%, up to 11%? Um, do you know... Uh, they've obviously not identified, as you say, that exactly where those are, but would you suspect that um, a high proportion of the 11% would be in areas like the Highlands and Islands, which are remote and rural? Um, that would be a logical um, assumption to make, but as I say, we have, and I think you know, that we, have, we have been unable to get linked to, to, to share. They say for commercial reasons, I'm not sure why it's commercial, but they say for commercial reasons they're, they're unable to share their criteria um, or their methodology, um, but yes, I think it would be rural areas and the more financially challenged um, communities um, in, in perhaps more urban areas would, would be the two most likely categories. Yeah. I mean, Thank it's you. interesting. I mean, we, we talk all the time about the, which we should do, about helping the people that are out. But in the work that I did in going around, what amazed me was how young people now manage the money much better than I used to do when I was their age, and um, because of banking apps. I mean, the average usage of a banking app by a young person is about six times a day. Um, it's the first thing many of them do when they get up in the morning. So that, uh, that's a real plan. So while we're doing all the critical stuff of this, which we should do, and I'm not saying it is, on the other side, we, we should be looking at where the advances are going that could help. And that's it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so there's two sides to all these stories. What, what, one of the things I asked, sorry. Sorry, um, I think we probably okay. need to... Um, just move on, uh, I think, uh, due to time. Um, Professor Griggs, just to go back to one of the points you'd made, I mean, effectively, would you agree with there being a proper holistic review of banking services and all of these issues to see where we're at and where we should be going, and then perhaps a change in the regulatory framework for banks um. to, to reflect this? I mean, you give the example of the Scandinavian country where the ATMs are run by... I suppose the state, if one wants to put it that way. Um, I'm, I'm hesitating because it, I suppose it depends how big you want this to be. So, uh, yes, I mean, Thomas and I have both said that there's a need for good, solid data, um, good evidence before we start making some of the decisions that we want to make, because a lot of it is anecdotal at the moment, and it has to be because of where we are. Um, in terms of regulation, I think we have to be careful here I mean, it's interesting now that most of our world is now, wherever we are, is run by voluntary regulation, not by statutory regulation. That's the same in food and, and all the stuff we do. Uh, so we need to do it in a way that's, that, that, that we can do it. And whether it's through regulators or not, I don't know. But yes, um, the, the challenge is, because this is changing so quickly, you could do a piece of study now that by two years' time isn't relevant because it's, the world's moved on, and that's one of the challenges that we all have. But I don't disagree we shouldn't do it, so the answer to your question is probably yes. Uh, and I suppose, um, is there much point in having consultations after decisions have been taken, which um, is effectively what's allowed for under the, the access to banking standard? Uh, yes, there is, because uh, strangely enough, there have been quite a lot of changes made to some of the, well, the way that the branches have, have come. So some have kept ATM, some of the buildings gone on to other use. Some of the, so there have been changes in the case, and there's not been any not closed, so before you ask me that question, but mm. they do so. So yes, I think it is, and it does help a lot 
from going to, and I spoke to what, a couple of hundred people when I did my piece of work, um, knowing what's going on and being told about it to any human being, and especially in these stressful circumstances, is useful. But yes, I think there is, there, there, if, it's, if that communication is done properly, it can add value. But, you know, the, a good example is Linker said it will, so there is, there is two phases, as you know, to the changes in the link charging regime. One is, I think, the 1st of July, um, uh, and what Link have said is that they will monitor um, what the impact is and they will report um, on any reduction uh, in the use, sorry, in the availability of free to use um, ATMs. Um, but, you know, that's it. Simply, simply monitoring um, and then reporting on how many ATMs doesn't do anything to help your constituents. Um, you know, and, uh, and it's very hard to use a cliche to put the genie back into the bottle. I don't think Link is suggesting for a second if at the end of that, that, that initial period, if, if, as I say, 700 ATMs have gone from Scotland, Link aren't suggesting that they are going to put those 700 ATMs back in at the end of their monitoring period. And that's why we're saying the PSR can't simply adopt a wait and see approach. It needs to intervene ideally, but I think, let's be realistic, after that initial charge change takes place in July, the PSR needs to be saying to Link, you cannot proceed with the second phase of changes to the charging regime until a proper evaluation has been done of the impact. And if necessary, the PSR should then intervene and do its job, do the job it is paid to do to, con to actually protect consumers. For better data and some proper research, but you haven't yet said what agency you think is responsible for that, who's best placed to do that. Uh, and secondly, there's a lot of uh, discussion about the possibility of legislating to prevent the last bank in town uh, leaving. Is it possible that rather than legislating to do that for banks, we should be looking now to do that for post offices, if post offices are so critical to the future of towns? Indeed you could do, and indeed you could argue that you could do the same for pharmacies. Um, so I, mean, I think this is part of the, once you start asking that question, it's about where do you stop in terms of um, rural retail, if I can put it that way. So um, um, yes, that's the answer to the question. You could ask yourself all sorts of interesting questions, but I'm not sure that legislation is the right answer, because in a lot of these things, it tends to become quite a blunt instrument, unless you write it very well, which has not always been the case. And the point on data, sorry, if I could push you. Sorry, on data, which, oh, sorry. So that there's, you have referenced several times in your evidence oh, right. lack of data and lack of research. What agency should do that? I, I don't know is the answer to that question, simply. Uh, I mean, I'll try and be quick. Um, on, the, on the data, first of all, I say, you know, 12 years ago, there was no shortage of people who were wanting to do stuff, um, if only we were in that situation. So I think it's, I think ideally, we'd like to see the PSR and the FCA together because they have, they have this silo mentality. As I say, one does banks, one does ATMs, and we think collectively they should be, they should be working with Treasury, um, but it should be the regulators who, who do that evidence. Being slightly mischievously, and, and not, you know, this is off firm bat here, really, if we want to do a Scottish uh, evidence, there are perhaps organisations within Scotland who could undertake their own um, 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 investigations and produce its own report um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the short term. But yes, ultimately it should be the regulators who, who should do this. On, on the question of the last bank in town, look, we, we are very clear, be very careful of unintended consequences. Um, the, the, first of all, there is this question about what is the town. I mean, I think about someone like Edinburgh, you know, um, even even somewhere like Edinburgh Eastern, how you know how how would you define? How would anyone define what is that that part of town where clearly going from Portobello across to Princess Street, whilst it's technically one town, it isn't it isn't practical. Um, and and secondly, there is this very obvious danger that if you've got two financial institutions that are in a town, um, and we have a legislation that says the last one standing has to stay open it's pretty obvious what happens next, which is the two financial institutions will race to shut their branch so they aren't the one left at the end of the metaphorical musical chairs. So we're, we're very cautious about actually how that, how that would work in practice to actually help consumers. Yeah. In one post office, though, arguably. So is the post office framework more important to preserve? It could be. 
It could be. And just on your data point, I think one of the challenges, or the reason I said I don't know, because to do this properly, you're going to have to do it over a period of four or five years, because it's not just about the immediate impact at what, because human beings are wonderful at just adapting to situations and returning to normal. So you would have to look at it over a period of about five years to get any real good empirical data of what the impact of all this has in an area. But if you want my, going forward for a rural area, the post office probably is as important as anything else. Thank you. Um, brief supplementary from Willie Coffey and then on to John Mason. Thanks very much for the chance there, convener. It was just on the figure that you gave earlier, Mr Doherty, that 56% 50 per, I think of uh, people use uh, online banking services and this mysterious other 44% don't. Uh, I mean, we know that the banks uh, brought in their closure programme based on their assessment of online usage, but doesn't that reveal that there's quite a, still a significant size of their customer base just can't or won't use online? And we know that's true from a lot of studies on the digital divide, that there's quite a substantial number of the population can't or won't use those services. So. Is that further isolating those communities, the elderly, the infirm, rural, and so on and so forth? And does that not really point to use of cash within that segment of society actually going up? Because if they're not using online, they must be using cash services or post office services on an increasing basis. So it's not, I mean, and obviously, we, I'd be more than happy to source the, the actual data if that's the helpful convener. But it, but it would be helpful. Also, if either of you wish to. Um, write in about any issues you've not had an opportunity to cover fully due to the, the time limitations here. That would be very welcome Absolutely. from the committee's point of view. But obviously, this was this was this was UK Finance um, produced that figure, um, and obviously, within that 44% that isn't. I mean, you know, obviously, we can we we make an assumption that, that all 56 are only using online, but of course, it's actually it is more complicated. Than that, but even if we pretend that all 56 are just doing online, for, for the for the for the remaining 44, um, there is a breakdown. Obviously, so some people are using telephone banking, um, some people are, as you say, um, using predominantly cash. The figure I saw, and again, we'll source the exact figure, was 2.7 million people across the United Kingdom. So, as I say, I would I would I would hazard a guess we're talking about 300,000. Scots, if we're seeing the similar patterns as elsewhere, um, are, are overwhelmingly cash. And they, they are in rural areas and they are financially excluded um, people. And I think that the challenge is, Willie, that, uh, that the data is so confusing that you can argue it either way. And I think that's part of the problem, as we both said. That, that if you, and that's why the Voltex one I thought was hilarious when it sort of came to three different conclu conclusions. But if you can, if you look at the data in three different ways, um, and I think that's part of the challenge is that the data is, each of the bank will have its own data. It's difficult to put all that together. And then if you look at other data outside of that, it, it's that the data in this area is not, is, is not good, if I could put it that way. Yeah. Thank you. John Mason. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, on, on the access to banking standards, I'm really wondering, is it working? Is it fit for purpose? Does it need to be changed or improved? I mean, the obvious one, we've already had this, that um, the customers and others have to be notified of a closure, but they are not consulted in a closure. Whereas other parts of society, uh, there would generally be consultation before a decision is made. Now, I know that in many businesses, they might have pretty well made up their mind before they consult, but at least legally, they would have to consult before a decision is made. Whereas with the banks, it seems to be the other way around. Do you, do you think we need to change that? No, I don't. Um, I, I, think it, I think the challenge is with each, of the, each branch, the consultation would have to be different. It's very difficult to, to do that. But I think if you go back to where the standard was, the, no consultation was, was decided by all parties in this, including the business associations, everybody, some three or four years ago. And therefore, when I went into writing the new standard, it was on the assumption that there would be no consultation. Um, it's... It, if you did a consultation, you'd have to then set some parameters and bars and levels. And I've thought about this a lot because I've been asked this question more than once. And I still haven't in my own head figured out how you would do one even if you wanted to do one. Mm -hmm. Because how many people do you have to get to say, I don't want you to do this before you don't do it? Um, and it, So it's, it's, it's a difficult it's a difficult consultation to do. And some of the other decisions you're but talking it, it, about... Would it not maybe give the impression that the banks were listening? 
if it did nothing else? Well, no, because I, I think if, if all they did was then carry on closing the branches, then it wouldn't have made any difference at all. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that would be the situation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in the way they notify, I'll come yeah. back to Mr Doherty, in, in the way they notify, we, we were in Leaven last night, some of us, and met some local community people, and their RBS had closed fairly recently. And they had one lady had this letter she showed us from the RBS, and it was... Um, I didn't read every word of it, but I mean, it just was, you know, closely typed, uh, just full of words. Uh, but, but as far as I could see, no information that they could go to a post office to use it. The post office just telling them where the next nearest branch was. Her reckoning was that was the wrong branch. That actually there was another one was nearer, or easy, at least easier to get to. Um, and the, the, there certainly seems to be a lack of understanding that the post office is a choice that's available to people. I don't think mm -hmm. people seem to know Agree. Uh, what they can Agree. do in the post office, and I don't think the banks seem to be making much effort to tell people that. So again, is there room for improvement around this area of notification? Uh, the answer to the question is yes, there is, and they're all improving as they go along, and they're learning as they go along, and I think you'll see in the coming months that perhaps an answer to the point about making everybody go in the post office. Um, they, they all do an impact assessment, so they do have the data which I've pressed them harder and harder and harder to just give everything they've got to the consumer because the consumer is an intelligent human being and does read it. Um, they need to do more about not just um, saying that they can go and do it at the post office, but how you do it at the post mm -hmm. office. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, there is a lot more they can do, but the Lending Standards Board, who now oversee this standard, have already started their work on going to each bank to evaluating how they're doing against the standard, and I know um, we'll issue a summary report later this year on their opinion on how that's going. But So there is now a, a compliance officer and in an inverted commas lending standards board that's going round with each of the banks, going through the standard and seeing how they're doing against it. Um, and they're better than they were, but they've still got some to do. Okay, thank you. Mr Doherty? I mean, I think what I would say first of all is we... We have sympathy with individual banks in that it, it, it's, it's a natural tendency to compare a change to a dental service or a GP service consultation with change to a bank. And an individual bank is not a public service, isn't publicly funded in, in that way. Um, but as a round, there is definitely a public duty on financial institutions to be able to provide consumers uh, with access, free access to cash and to banking services. It isn't just about getting money in and out, it's all the other things that, that, we, that we talk about. And our view is that, they're frankly, at the moment there isn't enough of a robust consultation going on. And rather than point the fingers at any one individual bank who happens to be going through the process at the moment, I bring it back to the regulators. We think that the, that the FCA, in terms of banks, and the FCA and the PSR, together in terms of access to cash should be reviewing um, that consultation process and I, I'm, we would argue doing more. Mr okay. Mason. I'll leave it at that. Thanks. And finally, um, I think that covers the questions for now. So thank you very much. Uh, as I said, if you wish to write in to fill out some of your answers, then please do so. Thank you very much for coming in today to the committee. I'll suspend the session for a change over witness, witnesses.
Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee, uh, again, we've reconvened in our inquiry into the impact of bank closures, and we have two uh, witnesses from uh, Link. Uh, first of all, uh, Mary Buffy, who is Head of Consumer Affairs, welcome, and also Sir Mark Boliat, who is the Chairman. So welcome to both of you. Thank you for coming in today. Uh, we'll start with some questions from Colin Beattie. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Helpful, you, you, you were sitting here while I was asking the questions previously, but let me put it to you that uh, we've heard evidence from a lot of the smaller businesses that around about 85% of their transactions are in cash. And there seems to be, especially in the case of smaller grocers and so on, a linkage to availability of cash machines in that particular area. How, 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 do, you, uh, how do you feel about ATMs and so on being very integral to that process? I mean, ATMs are a vital part of the payments infrastructure um, and we are committed to maintaining that uh, predominantly for individuals as opposed to small businesses. Um, ATMs at the moment are not equipped to take in large amounts of cash. They're, they're more about distributing cash than taking it in. And I think one of the problems with the closing of bank branches is uh, for those small businesses that do rely heavily on cash of actually putting it into a bank. Of course, one thing that's happening is that small businesses are increasingly using payment methods other than cash for precisely that reason. And that's not a matter for us, that's for the businesses and the banks. I mean, clearly, um, for a lot of these small grocers, particularly in areas of deprivation, um, customers who use ATMs tend to use them frequently for small amounts. And those small sums are obviously spent in the grocery store. And the, the linkage between the ATM, the grocery store, and the, and the client seems to be quite strong. It's an ideal situation if you're an ATM deployer because you can have the ATM in the grocery store and the ATM deployer is paid per transaction. So somebody who takes out £10 at a time as opposed to £100 in one go, the ATM deployer gets 10 times as much money. So I think where you've got a grocer like that, there will be an ATM and that would not be a problem. Uh, we do have problems in areas where there is nowhere to put an ATM. You do need a site for it. And a small grocer is, frankly, the ideal place, and many small grocers will have ATMs. Well, well at least one of the um, witnesses we had previously, a small grocer, uh, seemed to be indicating that he topped up the machine with money from his own till. How common is that? Uh, it's, um, it is a fairly common method of operating ATMs. Um, so people go into a store, they take money out of the ATM, they give it to the storekeeper in exchange for goods, and he puts it back in the ATM. It's called merchant fill, um, and it's a way of keeping machines going that otherwise would be very expensive to maintain if cash has to be taken away and delivered. But the previous witnesses uh, seem to be indicating that it was something unusual or strange that they, they, they had no knowledge of and they were indicating it was very difficult to manage. No, there, there no. are thousands of merchant fill uh, machines out there operating um, today so it's, it's certainly commonplace. Okay. There, there are some challenges, um, so just, just to add to that, there are some challenges around um, the retail site having to take enough cash to sustain um, the sort of cycle of, of filling it and then issuing notes. Um, so it doesn't work in retail environments where large amounts of cash are not taken because clearly there's no money to stock, uh, stock the ATM. So there's a certain model where that tends to work better than others. We talk about uh, remote ATMs and... ATMs in rural areas. How do you define a rural area? What's your definition of that? Oh, well, I'm saying we don't, I think, is, yeah. the, is the answer. Um, we have said that the interchange rate will not be reduced for any ATM that's more than a kilometre away from another one. Now, clearly that will cover a lot of rural areas. But you have no definition of what a rural area no. is. So, so the way that the programme works is it essentially um, tries to protect coverage of machines that exist today. So where um, customers in communities um, um, use an ATM and they rely on one ATM within that community, I doesn't have another one, another free to use within a kilometre. So kilometre distance is what's used across the industry and was agreed upon back in 2006. Um, 
that machine will not have its rate changed from the 1st of July onwards and will be protected. So there's no commercial reason why that machine should close or switch to, to surcharge. I mean, clearly there's a concern uh, about availability of uh, ATMs in rural areas, but how do you, def how do you define a deprived area? In terms of the Link Financial Inclusion Programme, um, it's, um, it started in 2006 as a result of the Treasury Select Committee hearing. Um, and essentially what was defined um, back at that time was we looked at the um, most deprived areas in England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, um, essentially units of, of geography called super output areas. Um, and using the index of multiple deprivation, we selected... Um, the bottom quartile of super output areas based upon the index of multiple deprivation. Can you explain the term super output? <laughs> so super output area is an, is an area defined by the Office for National Statistics and it's a geographical unit that essentially is driven by a size of a population. Um, so they have d varying degrees of, of size. There's super output areas and then there's output areas. Um, and essentially it can be all sorts of different sh shapes and sizes. So it's not a geographical unit like a grid. It's, it's basically a population. Um, and what we took as um, deprived was the bottom quartile for the index of multiple deprivation. And that identified just shy of 1,700 areas back in 2006 that were deprived, that didn't have a free-to-use machine within a kilometre of that area. How many of these areas were in Scotland? So in Scotland, um, there were um, 222 in total, of which 198 now have access to a free-to-use machine. I think it, it's just worth adding quickly, the number of ATMs has doubled in the past 10 years. And yet I hear that 700 have closed in Scotland. No. I mean, we, it's in, in net, I think the figure currently open in Scotland is probably the highest ever. 700 have not closed. I mean, there's always ATMs closing and opening every month. There's quite a significant churn for all sorts of reasons. But no, there's no, been no reduction. So the numbers have been maintained. It's a question of where they are. Yes, is it's, that it's at its highest level. So at yeah. the moment there are s almost 6,400 machines in Scotland, of which 5,400 are free. Um, well, I suppose one concern really is with the banks closing on the high streets, um, ATMs are, appear to be an integral part of the, of the solution for customers where these banks have gone. And particularly with vulnerable customers who have difficulty accessing banking services, the ATM becomes very much a cash line, uh, a lifeline for them. Um, to what extent do you take that into account? Does that, does that come into your calculations? Um, first of all, we don't run any ATMs. I mean, you may have got the impression from the last session that we, ma we run ATMs. We don't. We manage the network. So it is up to banks and independent ATM deployers as to where to put ATMs. But generally, I think the banks themselves will want to have an ATM if they're closing a branch, and ATM deployers, independent companies, will see a, a market opportunity. So you're saying that you don't actually have input into opening or closing ATMs? So we, don't, so we don't run any ATMs, we run the, the network. But as Mary has explained, we have a financial inclusion programme that is designed to put in ATMs that could not otherwise be justified. And, and that is agreed with the banks? Yes, absolutely. The banks are very supportive of it. The banks want a widespread network of ATMs, as we do. So how internally do you... I mean, is it simply a bank will advise you that they're going to close their ATM in a particular area? Is there a process for that? Um, they may do. Um, I mean, the, the banks on the whole haven't been closing ATMs. What they've been doing is, is selling their ATM estates to the independent companies. So they're selling them to companies that charge for them? No. Generally. No, no. I mean, the, the, the banks pay a fee to the ATM companies every time there's a transaction. Mm -hmm. So it's not to be... Um, the, the ATM deployers may charge, but that would not be a consequence of the banks outsourcing their ATMs. But most of the ATMs are now with independent suppliers. I'm thinking it's around... And half. And half. all of what you call the remote ones that are not in a branch, it's, it's, it's the vast majority of them. I mean, less than 3% of transactions incur a fee. 
um, link sets the central interchange as part and the operating rules of the, of the scheme itself. Um, the actual siting, as Mark has said, the, the decision to whether to install a machine, uh, where to install it, what to pay the retailer, all of that is not visible to link. It is essentially a, uh, an individual commercial ar arrangement between the operator himself or herself and the retailer. Um, they also have the ability to decide whether to charge the customer directly um, or whether they take the interchange rate that is set as part of the rules. It's all entirely done by our members. You make it sound very remote from yourselves. Um, well, again, I come back to what Link is. You know, we do not run any ATMs. We were set up to manage a network. And in Britain, we do have a single nationwide network of free-to-charge ATMs. This is unusual. You know, in most countries, ATMs cost money, you know, to run. And in most countries, there is a charge. So if you go to America, you'd be lucky to find a free-to-use ATM. So in fact, it's a really good system that has 70,000 ATMs. Um, most of them are free to use, and as Mary has said, only 3% of transactions are tracked to charge. Any card works in any machine. We think that is a really good system. And Jamie Halker Johnson. Thank you very much. Um, morning to the panel. Um, you, you mentioned about deposits, and you said uh, largely not available at the moment to do po deposits through, the, through your ATMs. I was just wondering what the barriers are to that. Is that down to the individual ATM? Operator, whether they whether they install the technology or the, uh, and what can be done to encourage that? It, and the link system does not accommodate um, cash deposits. Right. Um, money can be paid into machines in bank branches. Right. So, uh, as I've said at the beginning, I think there is clearly a problem with with small businesses that want to pay in uh, large amounts of cash. So that would um, only be available if it was an, it was a, a, bank, a bank ATM? Or if all of the banks wanted to do that, they could ask us to do it, yeah. but they haven't. Is, is it, sorry. I was going to say, effectively, um, what happens today is there's multifunction ATMs which will take deposits mm, of cash yeah. and um, notes and checks. Um, they are run by the banks, as Mark says, inside their bank branches, but they are only offered, those facilities are only offered to their own customers mm -hmm. in their own branches. If our members wanted Link to build a facility to have a central infrastructure to support deposits reciprocally, we would be open to doing that for our members. And I take it that Can would I be add? a security issue. Uh, thank you. I don't know if it was your constituent with £10,000 in cash. No. I think there might be some questions asked about depositing £10,000 in cash anyway. Yeah. Um, but the thought of having an ATM and a small retailer taking in £10,000 of cash would quite rightly, as you say, raise security and money laundering issues of that amount. And you may be aware an Australian bank has recently mm -hmm. been caught. Um, for large amounts of, of deposits. So there are security issues, and that's precisely why the banks, I think, want control of it, which they can have within their branches. It doesn't alter the fact that there is a problem for retailers um, if a branch closes, that uh, they will have to um, travel further to deposit their cash. We accept that. Okay, so that's unlikely something at the moment. Can I ask at the end very, very, very quickly? We, we talked about you know the availability of ATM. You talked about the sites and locations. Um, I mean, how easy it, it, easy is it for a business, for say, example, in a remote area where there's a, a, a no village shop, but maybe a village pub or a hotel? How easy would it be for them to uh, to, to to get an ATM within their within their building? A shop is quite easy. Um, uh, typically, they're grocers, but I did pass a, a laundry with an ATM, which I thought was rather odd. Mm. Um, you've got to have a shop front mm -hmm. or people going into the shop. And, and there are areas, and Mary does all the hard work on this, where it's agreed it would be really nice to have an ATM. The community needs it, but there's nowhere to put it. Mm. There's no retail space. Yeah. There's no so, retail space. Uh, th there's sort of two operating models, really. One is a cash-in-transit operating model where um, the um, transit organisations will deliver cash and they will load the cash, and the retailer plays no real function in that. Essentially, it's, it's run and operated independently. Those tend to be more expensive um, to run, mm -hmm. which is why we tend to find in sort of smaller locations, like small retail and convenience stores, it tends to be a merchant fill. So it requires a relationship between the operator and the, and the retailer themselves um, to have that agreement to stock and to run the machine. Um, yeah. But I mean, in, in something like, a, a, we've talked, uh, we mentioned earlier about the importance of tourism, obviously, of cash, yeah. particularly in a lot of areas in, uh, in, my, in my region. So actually, an area where there perhaps is a turnover of cash, like a, 
a cafe or a pub or a hotel or something like that, that would be suited. And how e I was just wondering how easy it is for them to to access uh, maybe a merchant fill um, yep. facility. So um, there are a range of our members that would operate in those sorts of retail environments. Um, a retailer has the ability to contact any of our members directly um, to see if they could um, come to an arrange a, a commercial arrangement to install a machine. Link also has something on its website called a suggester site. Mm -hmm. So if a member of the public or a retailer or a, a consumer group wishes to put forward a nomination for a site to install a machine, Link takes those emails in centrally and um, uh, disseminates them amongst our members so they can basically do a site assessment. Okay, so, so community, communities could come together and, and suggest... And say, nominate somebody. And nominate yeah. somebody. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. Um, and now, Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Who, who are your members? Uh, the members are the card issuers, banks and the building societies, um, and the ATM deployers. These are independent companies that provide cash dispenser services. So the, the grocers and people, they're, 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 not, no. they're not your, your, no. your, your members. No. Um, and so your role in all of this, as you say, is to manage a network. So you have yes. something that will work everywhere. Um, but you, you, you have taken the step of being um, uh, proactive in your financial inclusion yeah. program. Are there any other areas where you would uh, consider it appropriate to be proactive on the, f on, on, yeah. on, the, on the front foot and go beyond just managing a network? Um, it's worth just going back a bit of the history of, of all of this. Link was originally set up um, actually by some building societies uh, many, many years ago. Um, it then developed into a network for all of, the, um, all of the banks and building societies, and it was run by the members. And before I became chairman, and indeed even when I was chairman, the big decisions were taken by the members. Uh, that is not easy. There were 36 of them. And clearly the interests of the banks and of the ATM deployers are not the same. I mean, this is about a commercial transaction of how much is paid by one party to another. And they spent a lot of time trying to get agreement and couldn't. Now, fortunately, thanks to the Bank of England, which required that we had effectively independent governance, um, the responsibility for the key decisions was taken by the board of Link. Um, so the board, which will consist entirely of independent members, we have two bank members who have actually recently resigned, um, we now take the decisions as the board and we clearly have a public interest remit. We are not publicly owned, but we have a public interest remit. Um, and hence, not only have we run the financial inclusion programme well before I was there, which Mary has explained, we have expanded it. And that was our initiative, not forced on us by anybody else before we took the decision on interchange to um, have a higher premium. We would increase the premium from 10 pence to 30 pence. We have recently initiated an access to cash review and that will, the details will be announced shortly because we do need to understand the implications of the declining use in cash. Just to remind you, cash use has fallen, what, 30% in the past 10 years and I think the the, the forecast is 40% in the next 10. You know, now, we can't ignore that. Um, and we need to understand the implications. What we want to achieve is the continued wide geographical spread of ATMs. But the number clearly will fall. Um, we identified in our paper when we published the um, results of our consultation, there are some city centres with 50 pay-to-use ATMs. We don't think the public will be disadvantaged if that number falls to 40, or even to 30, or to 20. To, to give you a stat, there are 80% um, of ATMs are within 300 metres of another one. Um, so there's clearly some, some concentration, as Mark says. So on the, on, on the public interest remit, I mean, obviously banks are free to pull out of this network, but is the, is the position now that uh, your members are essentially locked into something that is so mutually beneficial to them that it would be... Uh, an odd decision to withdraw. I mean, they are free to withdraw. Um, we sincerely hope they won't. Um, we know all the banks are committed to what we're trying to do, and they warmly welcome. You know, they've been very supportive of the financial inclusion programme. You know, they want to provide nationwide access to cash for all of their customers. But, you know, to be fair to the banks, and I'm not here to represent the banks, you know, they have got a cost infrastructure which is now out of keeping with the market. You know, if people are using bank branches less and less, and that's why branches have closed. 
Um, but the banks absolutely want a nationwide network of free-to-use cash dispensers and are very supportive of our financial inclusion program. When we talked about increasing the premium from 10 pence to 30 pence, which means for an individual ATM be more than double the payment for each single transaction. There was no problem at all. The bank's very happy to pay that. It's providing the service to their customers that they want. So can I come back to the point um, you made earlier, Mary, about the no ATMs um, closing unless there's one at least within a kilometer? Um, we heard in the previous session, indeed from other witnesses, that there are unintended consequences of doing anything that would impose a burden on the last bank in town, because then you have a race to, to leave. How does that work with ATMs? I mean, if you're not going to, if, if one is not going to be uh, withdrawn unless there's one within a kilometre, you know, who, who, is it just a question of people come forward with proposals to close them? You know, how do they relate to each other? So, so the, the protected machines will be, so from the 1st of July, the new interchange rates will take effect. Um, and at that point in time, we will identify all free-to-use machines that don't have another one within a kilometre. And those machines will be protected. Their rates will remain the same. And so there's no commercial reason why a member should pull out. Um, what the Link Board has said in its announcement in January is that it will do whatever it takes to protect those machines. So... Um, that is why we've introduced a tripling of the subsidy to help to support those machines that consumers rely on as a single machine within a kilometre. Um, and it's, it's that commitment that the board has made. Yeah. Uh, okay. mean, as a result of what we have decided, there is no case for closing any ATM that is a kilometre or more away from another one. And that was clearly came from Link early on. It wasn't forced on us. That's what we and the members wanted. However, this is not the only factor. You know, the demand is falling all of the time. Um, and, you know, if ATMs close, it will be because of falling demand that make them uneconomic. But even then, with those protected ATMs, we will do whatever we need to do to maintain them being there. Uh, so, so, yes. So, so what you're basically saying is with those, for those protected ATMs, uh, there's nothing... Um, there's nothing that's within the responsibility of Link that changes, and therefore there's not a case to close them. You've now gone on to say you'll do everything you can yeah. to make sure that even for other reasons they don't close. Yes. I mean, that, I'm, I'm a bit surprised at that. Are you suggesting you'll step in, and what, what would you do? So, so Link doesn't, does not deploy ATMs. Yep. Um, but what the board has is the ability to take unlimited amounts of money um, from the members to fund and support protected machines remaining in situ for consumers' use. But how would that work? Do you just pay whatever the operator, the, whatever the operator wants? Or? Um, I'll give you an example. Um, so the, the, the interchange rate won't change. Say so you've got your remote ATM that is a kilometre, more than a kilometre away from another one. Um, so, as a result of the, what we're doing on the interchange rates generally, there is no justification mm -hmm. for closing that machine. However, if the demand falls for other reasons, 5, 10, 20, 30 percent, um, then the ATM deployer might say, well, actually, we can't keep it open. Not because of the change in the interchange mm -hmm. rate. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take away the commitment we had made, that ATM would have closed. But now, with the powers that we have got with the expanded financial inclusion program, that ATM operator can talk to us, and we can see whether a higher premium would be justified. Now, clearly, there can be the same issue as your last branch in town. Um, you know, we don't want ATM deployers trying to game the system, um, but we genuinely want to maintain those ATMs by providing an appropriate subsidy level. But there will come a point where what you can offer is disproportionate to the, um, um, you know, you, you yeah, wouldn't have a justification uh, in yes. offering a very, and very substantial deep, premium for a tiny number of customers. Chief Executive says a million pounds. Well, I think we might draw the line there. Uh -huh. um, I think we're looking at something, frankly, to take us for the next few years. Okay. Um, and that's why we've set, us, yeah. set up this Access to Cash Committee, to help us beyond three, four years. Um, you know, if... Um, transactions fall by 40% in the next 10 years, 30 or 40%. There are bigger issues, and we need to address those. Our own data show consistently this year transactions are 5% below last year. 
And getting back to the question that Jamie Halker Johnson asked about, you know, other services such as depositing checks and things, um, that's not something that you. <clears throat> I mean, you said that that's up to the, the operators yeah, and what they wish to do, and they deploy that within uh, bank branches. Yeah. And uh, but you, you have no sort of role in trying to either encourage that or promote it or think uh, about how it might be expanded to help particularly remote areas. I think also you need to note, going back a few years, people were seeing ATMs as being able to do all sorts of things like checking balances, topping up your ATM, changing your PIN number, all of those things. Almost all of them can now be done more easily by doing that on an app. But they can still be done on ATMs? Some of them can, yes. Some. Certainly checking a balance can be. Yep. But in terms of um, new services such as yep. depositing money, is that something you would try and promote or have an interest in encouraging if, or you leave it entirely it, up to them? Well, I think we ran through the, the issues on that. It, it is really very difficult for a small ATM in a grocer's shop to start accepting large amounts of cash. Yes. Um, and if it was large amounts, the, the merchant fill system doesn't work. You're left with a small retailer, you know, with a load of cash that is not in the machine. But, but depositing checks is not a security issue. I mean, that... Um, but question of why would you want to deposit checks in a machine when you can put them in the post? Or well, yeah. there's on online um, d digital check imaging. Yeah. It's being rolled out. Where photograph you them. photograph and you the the paper check never goes through the system. Yeah. Um, really? so you can do that. Image. It's, it's being launched by the check and credit clearing company. Yeah. Oh, it's not launched yet. It, yeah. I think it's in a phased rollout. Yes. I'm not sure exact oh, dates, but yeah. Okay. I'm sure Check and Credit Clearing would be able to provide you with uh, <laughs> with a lot more detail on that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, a supplementary from Kezia Dugdale. Thanks. How long does your um, commitment not to close an ATM within one kilometre of another last for? So the commitment's been made. So there, there's been an announcement to um, bring interchange rates down um, year on year for the next four years um, out to the end of 2020. Um, and the protected status will, will uh, remain in place for those machines for that period of time. As Mark has mentioned, what's being kicked off um, now is an access to cash review, which says as we get towards the end of that period and for the future, what, what does the size and shape of the network look like? Um, and, and so that the outcomes of those of that investigation and that research independent review will help to, to shape what happens beyond there. So this is just a fudge really, isn't it? It's just 18 months, this commitment to one kilometre. You said 2020, that's 18 um, months away. Well, I think it's more four years. Four years, I, yeah. I think, yeah, I mean, we're, we're reducing... 2018, the... and you said 2020. So Sorry, I, got, I got that wrong. It's for the next four years. So yeah. it's from the 1st of July for four years. Yeah. So no ATM will close that's within one kilometre of another for four years. That's a cast iron commitment. Um, but I'm reluctant to make promises we can't keep. We don't run any ATMs. There will be ATMs that will close for reasons that have got nothing whatever to do. But let me rephrase that. No ATM will close within four years of another within a kilometre for commercial reasons, which was your terminology earlier. Well, they won't close because we have reduced the general interchange rate because we're not for those ATMs. If the ATM deployer need to close them for other reasons. For example, my own a local ATM closed because the garage closed. Yeah. You know, we can't okay. stop that. So we're doing everything that we possibly can, but we don't want to make a, a promise that nobody could keep. Okay, and in your written evidence, you say that the number that could close because of the change to the, the interchange fee is somewhere between 1% and 11%, but KPMG have got that as high as 18%, but the difference between 1% and 11% is quite quite big. Yeah. That's 30 or 300 machines. What, what end of that scale is it? Well, I, I think what, because we don't want to give you know um, unreasonable precision, what, what we ask KPM to do is look very broad brush if the interchange rate falls by 20%, what do you think would happen to the number of free-to-use ATMs? And, and their estimate was, from memory, 10 to 18%. But that was before any mitigating factors. Now, ATM deployers pay rent to retailers. In other countries, the retailer pays the ATM deployer. Um, now, the rents clearly will be affected by this. ATM deployers will be renegotiating some of their contracts. That will mitigate part of the effect. Some ATMs earn income from doing other things. 
Um, not a lot, but there are other, other potential sources of income. So, you know, we can't give a precise estimate, and we certainly don't know the number. The notion we've got a list of them, we don't. But, but it is your own figure to say uh, that it's up to 300 ATMs in Scotland could close as a result of the interchange fee. Yeah, but that, that is out of is six... Is that correct? Uh, that is out of... Out of si out, as a result of what we have done, but that is out of the 6,000 in Scotland. I understand that. I'm just asking you to confirm your own figure, so it's, it's up to 300 ATMs in Scotland could close. We have indicated that we think the likely range is between 0 and 10 per cent. Well, yeah. you've got 1 to 11 per cent here, and that, okay. that figure is 300. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, De John Mason, Deputy Convener. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, we've, got, we've covered this quite thoroughly, but just if I could clarify the actual figures. At, at the moment, the interchange fee is around about 20 pence. Is that, is that my understanding? I have 25 yeah. pence. And so the standard one will fall by about a penny or thereabouts yeah. in July. 5%. Yeah, five percent off. So that's twenty-four or thereabouts. Now, at the moment, on top of the twenty p um, in a deprived area, there could be an extra ten p. So they would get thirty at the moment. Now, so, sorry, on top of twenty-five, it would be ten. So it'd be thirty-five. Yes, so the current program yes. um, provides ten, a ten pence premium if you run a free-to-use machine mm -hmm. um, in a deprived area, yes. and there's there's not another one within a kilometre, oh, effectively. Right. Yeah. And I would have to say, from my experience, that has worked. And because where I live is a deprived area and it is much better now at getting free to use machines than it used to be. So I'm certainly positive about that. And and, and that ten P could go up could go up to thirty P depending on circumstances. Yes. So then they'd be getting fifty five P. Yes. Yes. So that's approximately the figures, right? Okay. Yes. I was just trying to get my head around it because we were discussing it earlier on eh, and we weren't very sure about it. Right, I think that's all for me, eh, Thank you, Jackie Bailey. Could I pursue the figures just a bit further with you? Because according to our papers, the protection applies to, in effect, something like 221 Scottish ATMs. Is that right? That's out of a total of 6,700. Yeah. Yeah? So that actually it's quite a small proportion that's protected in this way. Yeah, but the ones we're protecting are the ones that are a kilometre or more away sure. from other ATMs. I, I understand yeah. that, but, but what the point I'm making is it's actually quite a small number given the overall size of, of, of the coverage. But it would maintain the geographical spread 100%, which is what we're trying to do. OK, OK. Let me pursue that slightly further with you, because um, of the ones that are left, your estimate of 0 to... Sorry, 0 to 10% or 1 to 11%, yep. let's, let's just sorry, agree yep. to disagree on those, those, those margins. Um, actually, it wouldn't be 300. It'd be something like 700 mm. ATMs. The figure we heard earlier not of ones that have closed, because of mm. course they haven't, but this is the potential you're looking at will be impacted. That's your own figures mm. that I'm using against the number of ATMs yeah. you currently have. Okay. Is that correct? So I, I think the estimate of 1% to 11% um, cannot be directly applicable to certain geographies. It is an estimate across the entire UK. So, oh, in so some do you have an estimate just for Scotland then? I mean, again, you, you, we, that sort of thing is just not feasible to do that sort of analysis. We don't run any ATMs, again, I, I have to say. But what, what, we're, said, what we're seeking to do is to maintain the geographical spread. As I drove here in a, in a taxi this morning and I looked at all of the high streets, you could see banks of three or four ATMs together. And you go 100 yards down the street and there's another three ATMs. And another 200 yards down the street, there's four ATMs. And I think if you come I, back... I could, I could point to several queues and cash machines running out of money at those exact banks of ATMs. Um, well, that's bad management, if they are. Um, uh, so I think you're going to see those sort of things, those numbers, you know, being reduced. But our commitment is to maintain the geographical spread. That is what is the main concern. If ATMs are busy, such that they're accused, the ATM deployers will not be shutting them. OK. It, it strikes me that 221, which are guaranteed, yeah. OK, spread across Scotland, is actually very thin coverage. So I'm oh, we, really agree. interested yeah. in how many of the 6,700 will remain. Now, if you're saying to me that it, your percentage figure lacks sensitivity to tell us what's going to happen, happen in Scotland, I would invite you to go back and try and get us more sensitive um, figures because at the end of the day, it is about the coverage overall. Yeah. Um, I, and to simply say mm. you'll protect 221, yeah. which is welcome, actually doesn't begin to address the sheer size of the coverage you currently have and what it could shrink to. OK, I understand that, but let me go back. Ten years ago, there were half the current number of ATMs in Scotland. 
and, and I doubt whether your committee was saying we desperately need twice as many ATMs as we've got. Now, the fact is we've got them. And taking something away, we know, has a greater public impact than if you never had it in the first place. Um, now, what's happening is a response to what the public is doing. The public is using cash less. The nationwide figures, and now I don't have separate Scottish figures, on our ATM transactions, and we look at it week by week, are down 5% on a year ago. If that is maintained for the next five, six years, and there are differing views, we'll get some new estimates, I think, in the next month. It could accelerate. Indeed, in London, I was a bit interested last week, and I came out of my underground station to find two people collecting money for a charity, one with a bucket, and one with a machine saying two pound contactless payment. You know, that is the sort of thing that you know, you're now beginning to see. So if the public are taking out cash from ATMs less and less, obviously the number of ATMs will fall. We can't give you a precise estimate. That is commercial decisions for individual businesses. In the same, you have retailers closing, which I'm sure bother most communities far more than ATMs closing. You can't ask, uh, you know, a retailer, how many shops do you think might close in the next four years as a result of people shopping on Amazon? You know, they'd love to know. So it will depend. But as I've said, we are committed to maintaining the geographical spread. That is what we think people are concerned about. And I would like to push you to give us more of a description of what that will look like. Because again, to repeat the point, not to labour mm. it, 221 out of 6,700 is what the guarantee is for. Um, we want to know where the rest are going to go from. And let me just make the comment to you that in the last decade, we've seen the growth of ATMs. Mm. We've also seen the closure of hundreds of bank branches. Yeah. I suspect there's a correlation between the two. Um, and for some communities, it's not just la the last banking branch that's in, it's the last ATM that's in town. And we obviously want to protect that uh, network, as I'm agreed. sure you do as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm just going to make a point on, um, so the, the 25 pence interchange rate is an average cost based on the entire network of 70,000 machines. So in crude terms, it's the number of transactions uh, divided by, uh, sorry, the number of eight, the cost divided by the number of transactions, essentially. Each commercial organisation that is a member of Link that deploys ATMs has their own operating model, their own set of individual costs, um, and the, uh, their own way that they've set up their business. So, the, for, so take, for example, rent that's paid to retailers. In some circumstances, that would be zero, um, and in others, it could be as much as £20,000. We do not have visibility of that on a site-by-site -site basis. So to be able to strictly say to you, this is the list that will close, it is very challenging. I, I would accept a broad estimate. At the moment, you're giving me nothing other than UK-wide figures. You know, so I'm not looking for, on each individual high street, this is what it will be. But I do think you can go further than you've gone for us today. I mean, we'll, we'll have a look at it, but I, I don't... Thank you. You know, it is not easy. I think we'd stand by our 1% to 11% as a result of the reduction in interchange. The far bigger effect will be from, from reduced usage. Now, interestingly, if we had not done what we've done on interchange, if we had done absolutely nothing you would have a greater rate of closure of ATMs. And because we had done nothing, we wouldn't be here being questioned by you. So paradoxically, by seeking to provide greater protection, um, we open ourselves up to public scrutiny, which we are delighted to do, incidentally. We are very happy to have this session or with anybody else, because our, what we want to do is exactly what you want to do. Excellent. So in that case, let's work together. And the more Absolutely. information you can provide us with, the better that will be. Thank you, convener. Well, on that uh, delighted note, we'll uh, close this part of the session. Thank you very much to our two witnesses. Thank you for coming in. The next item on the committee agenda is the Late Payment of Commercial Debt Scotland Amendment Regulations 2018, uh, or SSI 2018-160. In brief, these regulations amend the Late Payment of Commercial Debt Scotland Regulations 2002 that implemented the EU Directive on, on Combating Late Payment in Commercial Transactions. The instrument clarifies that representative bodies are able to challenge in the Court of Session the use of certain grossly unfair terms or practices in or in relation to contracts to which the Late Payment of Commercial Debts Interest Act 1998 applies. 
The committee sought the views of stakeholders who responded to a consultation on the issues of late payment. The Federation of Small Businesses noted their support for the changes made by the instrument. We have also received comment from the Food and Drink Federation Scotland. Does any member have any substantive issues they wish to raise, or are they content that the instrument comes into force? I take it from that we're all agreed and content with these. Thank you very much. I'll now suspend the meeting and we'll move into private session. <laughs>